How good is your yeah. voice, Frank? Huh? Will it carry to the back? I'll be all right, yeah. Scream. Well, can we get started? Uh, firstly, let me welcome all of you here to what is the first of what we hope will become fairly frequent free market foundation seminars on topical issues. We have hitherto, as those of you that have been associated with us know, confined ourselves more to, uh, shall we say, behind the scenes operations. And our members have agitated uh, off and on for more functions in which they would be involved, and in particular in which free market analysis or interpretation of topical issues is made. And uh, then we also have in the foundation uh, a group of uh, people who are perhaps a small minority who are, the, are of the Austrian school persuasion. Uh, that happens to include me and perhaps about five others. The rest tend to be monetarists or Chicago school or various other types of free market people, supply siders and so on. Uh, but I'm pleased to say that the Austrian school faction is growing very rapidly, which is easy when you're very small. You see, each uh, additional recruit uh, is a substantial <laughs> percentage leap in, in, uh, in membership. Uh, one of those, I'm pleased to say, uh, is, who's recently become a good friend of ours, is Frank Schostek. Um, we have a number of uh, distinguished people here, and it's customary to welcome them. I'm not going to do that, except to mention two, one of whom at the last minute could not come, and that is Dr. Herod de Kock, who was very disappointed he would have been here, and it would have been particularly stimulating to have him have his own report, or the final report, uh, analyzed from a Mycesian or Austrian perspective. I expect that uh, uh, Frank has confined himself to my Cesian perspective on account of even within the Austrian school there are different factions and schools. And let me welcome then the only other particular welcome I'll make, and that is to one of the perhaps godfathers of doyens uh, internationally uh, of the Austrian school, and that is Professor Lachmann in front here. I'm always uh, very <coughs> excited to be in his presence. And I look forward to the day when I can say to my children, uh, when they study him at school, at university, and uh, and uh, that I once knew him uh, when I'm at his age, which I hope I will reach. Uh, uh, Professor Lachmann, for those who might not know, uh, is perhaps one of the uh, most distinguished, if not the most distinguished, economists that have uh, uh, operated on South African soil. <laughs> And we are fortunate that although he now has an appointment to New York University, he does spend his, uh, he spends something like uh, six months or five months of the year with us in South Africa. So one of the uh, leading figures in the Austrian school over many decades, and uh, with some good fortune, he will uh, contribute also to the discussions. And with that, let me... Uh, introduce Frank Shostak. He did offer free of charge to the foundation to do this analysis, and we thank him for that. Um, uh, he offered to do it for members of the foundation, and basically all that have been invited are members and a few other guests uh, with whom we have a close association. Uh, he is the director of a firm called Econometrics, which does econometric modeling and forecasting and economic consulting. Can you hear at the back? It seems very far, and I'm not sure what the acoustics are like, but if necessary, you might have to move forward, especially for Frank, who's got to do more talking than me, and whose voice might wane. Um, he uh, did a PhD at Randolph Afrikaans University in economics under Professor Keert de Wett, who is at the back there, Dean of the Economics Faculty at Rao. And uh, I'm not going to say much more than that, except that uh, we have, uh, in the last few months, uh, as I said, become very friendly with Frank and uh, he's uh, somebody who I hope will make increasingly important contributions to the debate. I think what is significant at the present time in South Africa, and probably for that matter in the world, uh, in 
so various surveys actually show this. Uh, I won't go into them now, but that really the debate, I think, has ceased to be a debate between uh, dirigism or interventionism on the one hand and uh, spontaneous orders or free markets on the other, but is really the real debate that is occurring at an intellectual level today is increasingly a debate amongst free market schools of thought <coughs> or different approaches to uh, degrees of purism and different interpretations. Uh, uh, I uh, was particularly struck at a seminar at WITS recently where there were various approaches to development strategy, development economics being put, that really the left, I think, are in completely, completely in disarray and collapse. Uh, they, are, they talk increasingly about the crisis in economic thought. Well, I think many of us don't think there's a crisis. We think we're emerging from the crisis. What they perceive to be the crisis is perhaps, I think, the end of the crisis. And uh, we hope that the debate and the dialogue will continue to move towards a serious discussion amongst the market analysts of various complexions. And with that, let me hand you over to Frank, who will start with, firstly, an uh, introduction on the Austrian or Mycesian approach in general, and then a more detailed application of that to the final report of the De Kock Commission. Uh, Frank Schoster. Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here. I can't uh, consider myself as a Mesesian or even Austrian because I'm novice to this subject. I'm actually uh, more, more of an econometrician, so it's an uh, anathema for uh, <coughs> Professor Mises would be or for any Austrian. In any case, it's actually would sound uh, a joke that a person who involved in empirical research we we'll try to explain the uh, Austrian view on the economy because we do know that Austrians don't believe in measurement. They are against so-called positivism and historicism, if you want. So in other words, measurement is against the principles, against the belief of Austrian school. However, uh, during the last several years, uh, the economists most all over the world uh, found that there is a certain crisis in economic thinking, a terrible crisis. We discovered that our tools for analysis are not adequate. In fact, what we started to do is not what we do, did haven't, it wasn't re reconcilable with the facts of their life. And actually, that's really bothered me a hell of a lot. And uh, I couldn't get proper answer, neither from uh, neo-Keynesians, Keynesians, and uh, monetarism, or, or rational expectation, if you want. And uh, several, two years ago, I attended a seminar given by <coughs> Professor Lachman in his house, and uh, he mentioned slipped and mentioned the word uh, Mises, von Mises. Somehow I mentioned that uh, Mises had a certain debate or clash or whatever or disagreement or Keynes rejected whatever of Mises. I couldn't understand what Professor Lachman said. Nevertheless, I, I, I memorized the word Mises and uh, somehow actually I found this book and I went through this book, famous book, Human Action, and actually it's uh, was a, a revelation, I would say, for me, as a as a model builder who actually hates too much philosophy. And all of a sudden, I discovered that we really suffer. We haven't got enough philosophical thinking. And without philosophical thinking, I don't think it's possible to understand economic universe. Now, uh, from uh, further reading, I discovered that uh, I would like to give you some summary. Who was uh, Professor Mises? Uh, Mises, if uh, for the those of you who still don't know, was perhaps the uh, to my mind, maybe the greatest thinker, economic philosophical philosopher uh, during the 20th century, and maybe even the, the, the previous centuries. And uh, he was the uh, arch fighter for individual freedom. In other words, he believed that basically any economic analysis has to start from certain beginning. Uh, if, if I understood, understood correctly his whole theory, uh, the main complaint of Mises would be that most of the economies on Earth 
try to analyze things from the middle. And you know what, what, what happens when we start from the middle. In other words, the idea really is to start from the beginning. From the beginning, Mises would call it a priori. The a priori from somewhere which you can't explain anything. In other words, you start from the beginning, from the beginning how the universe was created, right? And why people doing certain things. The main assumption in Mises and economics that most of the behavior of the humans are voluntarily, they're purposeful. And he call it human action. And these two words, human and action, from human action, a person acts, he has developed a famous grand dual theory, which could answer most of the questions that uh, people would ask. And from here, he developed everything. Now, uh, the human action, the word human action is very, very important because it will provide us an explanation as to why people doing certain things. Mises fought very sharply against macroeconomics. He believed that believe that systems, macros, aggregates, don't create anything. They're dead, they're dead, they're dead creatures. What creates everything is life, uh, individuals. And the most important thing in Misesian theory, that people are moving and changing and doing all sorts of things because they feel uneasy, unhappy. And this sort of uneasiness causes them to act. Even if a person doesn't act, according to Mises, or doesn't do anything, he still acts because he decided to do this thing. Now, this is a very deep philosophical aspect. And uh, the question that people ask again, where Mises took all his theory, and of course, it's derived from uh, partially from uh, uh, Immanuel Kant, great German philosopher. He also took a lot of, a lot of his uh, uh, development from a uh, famous uh, founder of Austrian school, Karl Menner. Menger, and of course his, his, his teacher, uh, Bon Bever. And of course, all this, coupled with uh, other classical development, he has come with an important theory which can be classified as a Misesian type of theory. Now, the, the question that uh, people would ask is how uh, Professor Mises, or von Mises, would consider uh, Dr. de Kock report or commission of inquiry. If, let's say, he would be alive, what would he say on this report? First of all, uh, probably if I would try to anticipate his uh, reaction, it probably would be somehow somewhat negative. First of all, the report, as when I read it, appears to be uh, in spirit of freedom. In other words, as if it's very, very free, but because the, the writers of the report saying we would like free market, etc. So von Mises would like it, perhaps. After a while, the uh, authors of the report moving directly towards how they would like to prescribe various or implement various, uh, various, uh, uh, various things. And uh, here they would re they're recommending so-called Keynesian, neo-Keynesian, and semi-monetarism. And I'll come to this a little bit later. And of course, this will be uh, a strange, strange or strange thing for Mises and probably would reject this. And uh, before one would, I'll, I'll go into the commission of inquiry analysis, I would like just to provide certain uh, pitfalls uh, as far as the, my understanding on uh, how Austrian economics or Mises economics, probably it's also be in line with Mises and economics, with Austrian economics, how, how they view the uh, process of exchange. It's very important because uh, everything starts from the individuals. In Austrian economics, there's no such a thing as, a, as aggregates, as I said. Everything starts and ends with the individual. Individuals create everything. In Austrian econo economics, there's no such a thing empirical things. You don't really have to prove empirically that you're right. The most important thing, deductive reasoning. You have to have theory. In other words, and that's very important, most of the theories today, or so-called theories, are based basically on research. In other words, a person go, runs to the computer, makes regression, said he found a theory. No. Austrian approach is to have a very, very clearly thought out theory which based on deductive reasoning and which you can't really uh, disprove, right? And, uh, and, and therefore theory, deductive reasoning is ultimate for everything. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, various, uh, uh, various critics used to call them uh, so-called uh, tautologies because uh, because if you start from something which is a priori, which is unknown, of course, they used to say it's everything is self-contained. However, Mises explained that this is not the case, and I don't want to go too deeply in the, into this issue. Nevertheless, the important thing is that deductive reasoning is the, is the criteria for everything. And uh, if one looks on this type of approach, one discovers that even in the Bible it's written the following, that prior to any action, 
a man has to think. That's very important. You think before you act. And that's where I believe von Mises perhaps took his, his logic also. Maybe he used the Bible also. <laughs> maybe somehow it came to him. Nevertheless, thinking has to precede action. Now, if thinking is bad, what will happen? The actions will be very bad. And if the actions are bad, what will happen to the results? It will be disastrous. Therefore, therefore, Austrians are so concerned with the precise definition of think, precise thinking, before a person can act. And uh, in many respects, we're impatient to this, but I found it's very important. Now, how basically uh, Austrians or Misesians would, uh, would uh, explain uh, market? Why people really exchanging things? Market in Misesian economics is basically human action. Market is the life. People are act because they want to be alive. Now, if they won't be action, they, don't, they won't be movement, they won't be alive, basically. So market is a principle of life, and market is expressed in terms of exchange. And let's have a look on two people here, Shoemaker and a baker, and, uh, and they're exchanging. Uh, Shoemaker exchanges shoes for bread, and a baker exchanges bread for shoes. Now, normal economics would tell us, would tell us that basically when exchange took place, <laughs> shoes equals to bread. And that's precisely where Austrian differ. They say, on the contrary, it cannot be equal. If there will be equality, then there wouldn't be exchange. On the contrary, the reason why exchange took place, because the shoemaker values bread much more than shoes, while the baker values shoes much more than bread. And that's very important, in other words, because there is divergent valuation, right? Divergent in valuation, that's why there is an exchange. The question now is, of course, how how this particular exchange or ratio between, between two commodities is determined, right? And, uh, and Austrian, uh, due to uh, uh, Karl Menger, have developed so-called utility theory, which I'll come within a second. But the important thing to say is that price of respective commodity determines by the intensity of need and availability. That's really what we call value. And value is dictated by the satisfaction derived from the marginal unit, last unit. Very important thing from the last unit. In other words, in other words, what really happens is the following. When a person got a certain amount of, of goods, and of course, he has to decide which unit of this good is going to consume, right? Which one is going to consume? And of course, he has to elect certain of, one of them. And the moment he elected the first one, it means he, he valued the first unit as the highest because it served to satisfy his most urgent needs, his most, most urgent needs. Therefore, the value of this first unit, according to, to Menger theory, or after this Misesian theory and Austrian theory, would be that the, most, the first unit would carry the highest value because the individual decided this way, because he used it to satisfy his most urgent needs. The value of the second unit will, will actually, the value of the second unit will not carry the same value as the first one, because it will meant to satisfy the second most urgent need. And, uh, and, and uh, therefore, one can say after this that the ultimate value of the overall product will be determined by the last unit that the consumer chosen. Now, this was an important re revelation, revelation for solving various problems. For example, people couldn't resolve the issue of the value why diamonds right, are less valuable than water, for example. Pardon? Yes, it should be less. Yeah, and uh, and uh, th this really created a serious issue as to uh, uh, in the past as to how why water is less valuable than diamonds, right? And of course, this theory has resolved it, namely that the marginal unit, the marginal unit or the last unit, right, carry it, right, less value because there's more, much more plentiful water than diamonds, and that really was an important development. And uh, co consequently, the Austrian came to important conclusion that really how values are determined, and uh, the values according to the Austrian is determined in the mind. Right? This is a subjective concept. It's determined in the mind, and it's all the time changes. In other words, at this at this present moment, I got certain valuation for particular good. Within two seconds, I can change my mind, right? And I'm entitled to do it. So values, right, are all the time all the time moving and all the time changes according to subjective valuation by the individuals. And the most important thing, that 
the Austrian maintain, which comes from this, that formulas do not determine prices. Formulas do not determine prices, as many people believe, that formulas will determine prices. Not, not at all. Prices are subjected to ongoing changes, which are determined by individuals' valuation, and this is changes all the time. So therefore, important concept that value, according to Austrian, cannot be measured because it's in our mind, and how one can really measure something which is in our mind. And any attempt to use formulas, according to the Austrians, would be really a strange, strange thing. And it's like somebody would say, let's measure love. One, one person loves the other woman so much, and the other, the other couple loves, loves different. And then, how can we measure love? It's impossible. Love is immeasurable. The same applies to the values of various things. It is, it is determined in the mind of the individuals. Now, this is an important development. And, um, and let's, now, let's now summarize one important thing, that when individuals acting, acting means they're also choosing. When they're choosing, it means they're deciding either to take commodity one or either commodity two, nevertheless, they will, they will have to decide. Or they can decide not to do anything, right? But all the time, they will have to prefer one on the other. And the moment they prefer one, it means it will satisfy the greatest satisfaction they, 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 they need. And uh, having this described in a nutshell, in a nutshell, the process of exchange, and uh, we will require this very soon when we're going to analyze the, the COC Commission of Inquiry. I would like also to provide additional contribution of Mrs., namely, uh, how he solved the issue of interest rates. Uh, the interest rates, or what is interest, concept of interest, was never clearly understood. I don't think even now we understand it. I'm not so sure whether I'm myself in a position to understand it. Nevertheless, after reading Mrs., I discovered certain interesting things. Number one, uh, people or economists still maintain that interest is supposed to be a uh, return on capital, for example, or it should be sort of a, like a profit on something, or whatever, all sorts of names. However, Mrs. Mrs. said, or some people saying, interest is price of money, using the Aristotle, Aristo uh, concept that money is a barren thing, and therefore, and therefore it's also bad to charge even interest on it. Consequently, uh, von Mises showed that basically interest rate is not a usury is not a very bad thing, it's part of a human action, part of human behavior. Without interest, we can't really have human behavior, and vice versa. And how he proved it? He proved it actually very interesting. He said, and he used, of course, the, the, the approach developed by von Beverk, the time preference approach, and what he said is the following. He said that every man prefers present to future. And then, of course, I would ask, but why? And then it says, if man prefers future to present, he will die from starvation, right? That's an interesting st statement. And then he proves it. Now, let's assume that man prefers future to present. Let's assume he prefers present, uh, future to present. What will happen? He will not consume today because he prefers the consumption for tomorrow, right? And the moment tomorrow arrives, right, it will be present, right? So again, it will shift it for tomorrow. So what will happen? It will never consume. It will die from starvation. <laughs> therefore, <laughs> therefore, an individual will always have to prefer present for future. What does it mean he prefer present for future? It means that he will assign greater value for present than future. In other words, future will be at a discount. Now, this is what Mrs. called the original, original, or original interest rate or real interest rates, if you want to call it or real interest rate. Therefore, interest rates is not something strange in space and weather. It's something natural which comes part of the human behavior, right, which was hell of a overlooked by economists. And consequently, Mises also asked the following question. How the preference, how the value between present and future can change? In other words, interest rate or interest is an exchange rate between present and future. It's like you got today's goods and tomorrow's goods, and you got rate of exchange between the, these two goods. And he said the rate of exchange between these two goods will be determined again according to certain quantities, right? right? And according to marginal value, the same theory we applied before. Therefore, he said the following. If there will be abundance of goods and services in the world, right? of course, the marginal utility or marginal value of the, of, of the units 
uh, will drop, and consequently the rate of exchange between present and future goods also will drop. And given the fact that there's no risk, risk is constant, for example, or we call it that the time preference doesn't change, then on the same time preference schedule, right, if you want to use it this way, uh, the interest rate will be much reduced. Why? Because there's a balance of everything, right? However, if, for example, there'll be some disruption, and we know that future will last only a few days, immediately, immediately, the individual will value hell of a lot the present, hell of a lot the present, and the real interest rates or the discount for the future will be enormous. That's why one observes countries which are suffer from poverty and uh, subjected to hell of a risk, those countries you will find got very high real interest rates. Now, if we introduce later on money, you will see what happens. Now, so given, uh, uh, given this approach, it provides actually very important illustration how real interest rates are developed. Now, if somebody got difficult to still understand what are the interest rates in the Misesian model, I have decided to produce additional explanation. And uh, I think it's very simple. It's not if, if always easy to simplify. But let's have a look on this one. Let's assume you intend eating an apple. And you got several apples, right? And, uh, and then I approach you and say, look, I wish to borrow the apple, and I'll return this apple one year later. You refuse. Why you refuse? Because you value the present apple, right, much greater than the future apple, right, as a, as a result of the time preference that we discussed. However, if I realize that your val valuation is as such, therefore I would like really still have an exchange, then, I tell, then I'm offering you repayment of one and a half apple, right? That, as it happened, you have accepted. Why? Because you value, in your mind, apple and a half year from now at a greater extent than one apple today. And therefore, we have an exchange. And the question is, of course, what is the interest rate in this exchange? The interest rate in this exchange will be half an apple or 50%. Is it real interest rates? Very real. It's half an apple, right? So the interest rates appeared here in this situation without really having money or whatever, right? We've got half an apple, very real situation. Now, how people tend to confuse money and interest rate, it's a very a great myth. However, let's have a look how it can happen. We do know that in the world we operate, we need money, and I'll come to this later on in different framework, as a means of exchange. And Mises was very careful to distinguish between means of exchange and means of payment. And he called it deliberately as a means of exchange. And let's assume in this simplified example that one apple costs one rent. Therefore, if one apple is one rent, exchange it for one rent, right, then I'll be indifferent whether it'll give me apple and a half or one rent 50, it will be the same story. The rent interest will be 50 cents or 50%. Let's assume all of a sudden that South Africa's Reserve Bank had a problem to control money supply, and consequently, the value of money dropped. In other words, the, the, exchange, the, the, exchange of the, uh, the, the value of the exchange has dropped. And what we will we'll discover, that prices, prices or exchange or, or, of apples in terms of money will rise by 10%. And therefore, we'll discover that since after one year I still owe you apple and a half, I'll be concerned not with rents as such, but I'll be concerned with apple and a half. Therefore, if I want to repay you something in rent terms, I'll have to give you back real purchasing power. That's what Mises always, always emphasized. People want real purchasing power. They're not interested in carrying papers in their pockets. And therefore, I have to give you back equivalent of apple and a half. In this respect, one rent 65, because price of apples went up by 10%. What really happened to interest rates in this case? Now they become 65%. Why they become 65%? Because the value of money dropped. And why the value of money dropped? Be as a result of one and only one fact, because we printed too much money. Now. Now, we're asking ourselves the following question, as I showed you before. How, in the, in the Apple economy, interest or Apple interest rates can go down, right, or can go up, right? It can go up or can go down according to the abundance of apples. Now, if we got plenty of apples, then, of course, the subjective valuation of each apple, right, drops. And therefore, the rate of exchange between present goods and future goods also will decline. And therefore, abundance means we'll have much lower interest rates. Now, when we print money, 
in the economy when they print money, and we know that money is means of exchange, people all the time assume that every money supports a particular real goods and service. In other words, I call it so-called backed money. In other words, in other words, every piece of rent in the economy should represent some real goods and services, right? It will be clearer in the middle of my discussion. The important thing, every rent supports some real goods and services. And the moment people observe, people observe plenty of rents as a result of printing press, initially they don't know that this, is, this scam is a result of printing money. They believe there are more apples in the economy. Since they know more rents is more apples, therefore immediately the interest rates in their mind has to drop because there's more apples means the rate of exchange between present apples and future apples has to drop. However, after a while, they realize, and they're a good observer, that this is not the case because they realize there are plenty of rents but not so many, many, many apples. And therefore, they reevaluate back the situation because they were fooled, right? And they, you can fool them again and again. It's, it, won't help, it won't help it. Will hap uh, it will happen again and again. And after a while, they will readjust. They will readjust in rent terms the interest rate, and the interest rate will go up. Now, this is, again, just to give you a concept, simple concept, how interest rates could be determined. Now, so the, to finalize, interest rates is not price of money in the Misesian model. Interest rates are the rate of exchange between present goods and future goods. And, uh, and uh, Mises was very concerned with inflation, as everybody in this, in this country. And uh, however, while South Africans or Americans define inflation as a persistent change in consumer price indices, Mises had a problem with this because he believed that this was a distortion of truth because changes in consumer price index are just symptoms or changes in all the prices are just symptoms of so-called inflation. In other words, for him inflation was changes in money supply, changes in money stock actually even, changes in money stock. Why? Because if you, if you go to a dictionary, in the dictionary, all dictionaries, inflation will be defined as increase in money supply, something was inflated. And therefore, and therefore, if one is concerned with inflation, well, not, only, not really concerned with prices as such, because Mises used to say, prices as such, if they're going up, and if, I, if everybody adjusts his prices, then it's not the issue. The issue is not that price is going up. The issue is, is what damage inflation does. In other words, Mises and economists should be were concerned not with the term inflation, but with the consequences of inflation. They weren't concerned with consumer price indices. They were concerned with the consequences of a disease. Consumer price indices are symptoms. The changes in price indices, there will be symptoms. And we're not concerned so much with the symptoms as what the consequence of disease will be. And uh, the reason is very simple, because Mises has shown that, in fact, inflation is like a robbery. In other words, it's like somebody who prints money, right? And, uh, and if a person prints money, what happens to him? If he forges money, what are we doing with this person? We'll put him in jail. Why? The reason behind it is very simple, because he buys real goods and services which he hasn't contributed to his production. In other words, he is a thief, he comes and consumes something which he didn't contribute. And let's have a look how it could be presented in a very simplistic model. First of all, imagine a world of a direct exchange. And in this direct exchange, we got Schumacher, Baker, and a butcher. And uh, Schumacher likes bread, right? So he took his shoes, he produced shoes, and shoes are means of payment. In this respect, a means of payment. He pays, he wants to pay with the shoes because he doesn't really want shoes, he wants really bread. And he approached the baker. And Baker said he's not interested in, in shoes. So the Schumacher had a problem. He produced shoes, but he's hungry now. Now Baker. Baker wants to eat a meat. So he brought his loaf of bread to a butcher, right? And the butcher said, but I'm not interested in bread. So but now Baker got a problem. And the butcher wants to wear his shoes, so he approached the shoemaker and said, look, I would like to exchange, I would like to exchange meat for <laughs> shoes. And the shoemaker said he's not interested. So here we got a situation, people produce things for, in order to exchange them, right, to use them as means of payment in order to benefit from things they want, and they couldn't. Therefore, the so-called direct exchange had a serious problem, and that's why human beings over thousands of years, as uh, Menger has developed, showed, has showed human, uh, humans developed so-called indirect exchange. And it's important thing 
that indirect exchange or money hasn't developed because government has decided to have money. It has developed because human beings wanted it, because they found it as important as necessary things. And the so-called commodity money, right, or commodity which, which served as an exchange, and why it served as an exchange? Because any, every commodity got two particular elements. One, elements of use, you're using it for yourself. The other is for exchange. The moment the element of use becomes very small, an element of exchange becomes very large, it can be useful for exchange. And of course, it has to comply with certain market, marketability, whatever. Nevertheless, let's accept money was created. And we use money as an indirect exchange, as an indirect exchange, nothing else. And, and of course, important to realize money commodity money is not a barren things it's not a veil or whatever it becomes an important commodity which provides service what kind of service you can see right away Schumacher wants a bread so all it does he exchanges money right and he get bread from a baker and a baker exchanges money and gets meat and a butcher exchanges money and gets shoes everybody is happy in this economy exchange took place why because a particular means of exchange was developed, which enabled particular magic. And this created the possibility of satisfaction for these three individuals, which are baker, shoemaker, and, and a butcher. And this is really how, after the exchange took place, how things looked like. The shoemaker got bread, right? Butcher got shoes, three pieces, and baker got three pieces of meat, and everybody is happy now. That's really what they wanted. And uh, they, they, everybody is happy. Now let's imagine that a person, a thief, arrived to this economy, and maybe he came from the Mars, and it, and it discovered something interesting, that you pull out a piece of paper and you get real goods and services. Those people are crazy. You give them a piece of paper and they get something real. So why can't they afford such a thing? And he also went and print money, right? And then and he print identical money as the butcher got, and as the shoemaker got, and as the baker got. And what he did, he went quickly and exchanged them, right? for goods and services, and he liked them. Which one? He liked meat, he liked bread, and he liked shoes. And that's what he did. However, nobody realized this immediately. And uh, all of a sudden, the, after the exchange took place, the uh, shoemaker discovered that at the end of the exchange, he ended up to have two pieces of bread and one piece of money. However, he can't eat money. You can put salt on it. It's not very tasty. So he had a problem. Then a butcher discovered that he got two pair of shoes, but he couldn't wear money. So he had also a problem, become a little bit poorer. And a baker discovered that he got only two pieces of meat, and he couldn't really solve the money, so he had also a problem. So those guys really had a problem. The, the, the producers were robbed, right? So they were robbed, and how they were robbed? Because somebody printed money, right? And somebody used, robbed them from the real goods and services. Therefore, therefore we're saying that Inflation, in this respect, will be the, resp the, the respective exchange value of a particular exchange. In other words, the respective value of effort of each individual, each producer has dropped. Why? Because before each real unit of production would exchange for re one real unit of production, now it's only exchanges for two thirds or one real unit. That's really what we say. We inflation, consequence of inflation is a misery, right? Is a theory, or we call it redistribution of income, and this is in the plain, language, plain English, somebody has stolen the real goods and services. So therefore, therefore the question is now, the question now is, what really happened? And uh, we would like to have an economy when means of exchange are serving as only means of exchange. In other words, we don't want too much of means of exchange, not too little. Uh, monetaries or Keynesians try to provide some formulas as to what size, quantity, what amount of money should be in the economy. Uh, Misesians or Austrians believe that any quantity of money is good. Doesn't matter what amount of money will be in the economy, as long as it doesn't change, it will do its job. It will do its job. Doesn't matter how much. Von Hayek would say, Whatever it is, fine, don't add to it, it will do the job, right? It will do the job, and you don't really have to bother about it because the function of money is not really to consume it as such, but just to satisfy, to enable the market economy to operate. Now, without money, we can't really have market economy. We can't have division of labor. We cannot specialize. Therefore, on a simplistic level, we would like to have at least each money backed up by real goods and services. In other words, each money is being produced by shoemaker, 
by baker, by butcher. We don't want money which has been produced by thief, right? That's very important, right? And therefore, the moment we got money which is produced not by producers, but by robbers, right? We've got serious problem because then the producers are suffering, right? The producers are suffering. Now, the moment we see such a situation, we call it inflation. Various uh, politicians in the world getting getting paranoid, and they say, well, there is inflation, and prices are going up, and we have to solve the inflation. How do we solve the inflation? First of all, symptoms of inflation, prices going up, right? And it's good. Symptoms have got to be, got to tell us what's really happening. That's why they, we call them symptoms. However, yeah, they're not meant, it's not meant to suppress the symptom. And the moment politicians see prices are going up, they panic and they say, well, we have to cool off the symptoms. How can we cool it off? Well, one way of doing this, remove them, right? Right? Remove them and everybody will be healthy. Imagine you got kidney or liver problems, which follows by high temperature, right? You can really remove the temperature by taking a panada. Would you solve kidney or liver problems? No way, it's impossible, right? Or if you got a headache as a result of kidney problems, somebody would advise you to cut the head. It solves the problem also. We don't really want such a things, right? So basically, in many respects, so-called economic management, right, or managing the economy, managers of the economy saying, what we have to do, basically, is to cool off the economy. Let's subject the economy through recession. Why? Because during the recession, prices might go down. And since inflation, they believe, is prices going up, then during recession, prices will go down and there won't be inflation, right? This is, again, a fallacy, but that's really how people all over the world believe. Therefore, they say, let's fight inflation by cooling off the economy. Let's put the economy into the fridge, right? And, and cooling off. So we say cooling off. It's not very good. Why? Because you suppress, perhaps you reduce prices, you, you, de you depress the people, depress the butcher, depress the shoemaker, you kill him completely maybe. And after a while, you're not necessarily will remove the, the thief's money. Thief's money might be still there. In other words, not necessarily the value of money will drop because inflation is a relative concept. It's a relative concept means how much money in relation, in relation to real goods and services. Imagine a situation, Uganda. Several years ago, the dictator Idi Amin been told there is an inflation in Uganda. So he doesn't understand what it is. He asked, what is it, inflation? So somebody told him, inflation is prices going up. So then he says, so what's the problem? Who's well, causing the increase in prices? He said, Indians in the market, they're pushing prices up. Well, kill all the Indians, and there won't be inflation, right? <laughs> and that's precisely what happened. He killed all the Indians, right? So what ha really happened? No production took place. No production took place. Well, plenty of, plenty of shillings, Ugandan shillings, were in the system. However, and price indices didn't go at all up. Why? Because it, they, they weren't permitted to go, to move anywhere. They were frozen. However, there was very high inflation. Why? Because the value of Ugandan shilling was close to zero. Why? Because nothing was produced and nothing this shilling could buy. That's really what inflation means. Nothing you could buy because the producers disappeared, right? So you can walk with your money. You can buy nothing. If you want, you can eat them. So therefore, of course, the solution, of course, is not to cool off the economy, but something else. If somebody wants to manage the economy, as Austrian wouldn't agree, but suppose we want to manage the economy, what one should do, perhaps? First of all, try somehow to reduce monetary growth, but just monetary growth, if you can or try to somehow to expand the amount of real goods and services, right? In other words, to expand the relative value of the money, or increase the unbacked money, if you want, or back money, or both, something which Reaganomics is, is, is been, been uh, uh, Reagan tried to pursue, in other words, expand the amount of real goods and services, reduce the monetary growth, somehow get to something which called excessive monetary growth gets lower and lower. And, of course, this is not, it's easy to say, not very easy to do. And here I would like to come now to how the Commission of Inquiry uh, tried to tackle the inflation in South Africa. And uh, the Commission of Inquiry had serious problems, first of all. Uh, it had to investigate, it had to investigate the causes for inflation. And uh, it was understood eight years ago that inflation could be, result, could result as a result of excessive fraudulent money. So therefore, the Commission of Inquiry had to devise a recommendation as to how to prevent excessive printing of money. However, the Commission had serious each problem. Why? Because it was understood right from the beginning that the biggest printers, biggest printer of sources of money is government itself. 
and not really the banking sector as such. Banking sector as such is a passive element. In other words, the government somehow managed all over the world to create a banking system which will be conducive to finance its deficit whether directly or indirectly, but that's really how it was created all over the world. And uh, one way of doing this, of course, was to have so-called central banking banks. In other words, banks which are controlled by central bank. And uh, that's where the commission of inquiry went very wrong because it prescribed so-called free market tools. Free market tools, however, it didn't realize that this ma free market tool could not be applied to a system which is not free. With no, no banking system in the world is subjected to free banking. There's no such a thing free banking today in the world. The banking today is totally unfree. It's one cartel. And let me just distinguish between free banking and unfree banking. What does it mean, free banking? Free banking means tomorrow or today or whatever I felt like to have a bank. And I set up a bank called Frank Shostak Limited, right? It's called the bank, right? And I have saved 1,000 rand. And I called, and on my liability side, there is a capital, 1,000 rand. And then I also decided to lend this money, right, for, to somebody, to Paul Ilov, for 10%, right? And that's it. And after one year, he will give me back 100 rand, right? And so we got, we got 1,100 on the one side, 1,100 on the other side, and everybody is happy. We may, I made profit, or I believe I made profit. Paul Ilov has the benefit, everybody benefit. And in this respect, we don't create money. Bank, in this respect, is does is important function it facilitates trans facilitates so-called so-called transfer of money or resources from, from so-called surplus unit to deficit unit that's really what the lending bank is all about however and these banks of course never created any any problems that's that's these banks were very welcome and uh, this bank operated very nicely however the problem started when we started, the, the humanity developed so-called deposit banks. Deposit banks are different from lending banks. Why they differ? Because deposit banks started when uh, various holders of jewelry deposited so-called jewelry uh, with the uh, so-called warehouses, right? And uh, as you know, most of the people are suffer from temptation. They got temptation to steal, right? Everybody got this temptation. And, uh, and the interesting things that happened or been confused that nobody realized that these guys were warehouses. Now, how do you treat warehouse when you bring a fridge to warehouse and you want to keep it for one month in the, wa in the warehouse? You store it, store a fridge there. Let's say Paul Ilov is a sto storekeeper and I brought the fridge there. So what really Paul Ilov will do? He will give me a receipt. Frank Shostak has deposited a fridge. Fine. Now, he will never write this fridge as assets or as a liability because it's not his assets, it's also not his liability in this respect. All he really will tell me that yeah, I have deposited this, this or for, stop, for keeping this fridge and he has given me a ticket or receipt. The problem started when homogeneous goods started to be deposited like gold and uh, then the temptation took place and the warehouses started to issue tickets which were unbacked. In other words, if somebody put 100 ounces of gold and the warehouse issued 100 equivalent of tickets, this was fine. But after the, these warehouses become greedy, they started to issue a little bit more than they really had, right? Taking the chance that these guys won't collect them, right? Things become a little bit serious because they created fraudulent money, unbacked money. And, uh, and of course, bank of this nature, which we call deposit bank, started to create some problems. However, we argue that if there will be plenty of banks of this nature, the, or warehouse bank or deposit banks, we argue that those particular banks will never be able to lend much more than they got. Why? Let's imagine that a particular bank, and there are thousands of banks of this nature, lends, I deposit 100 rand, and immediately gives me a check deposit of 100 rand, and I can go and buy goods and services. Also simultaneously wants to be greedy, and he lends extra 50 rand and he issues extra 50 rent checks. What will happen? And that's precisely Mrs. point about free banking. What will happen? The 150 checks will float around, and by mistake, they will, they will go back, not to the bank, original bank, but to some other bank. There will be clearing between banks, and the other bank will, will clear present the 150 rent against the first bank. However, the first bank got only 100 rent cash. 
So you've got a serious problem, it will have to go under. Therefore, therefore, under competitive free banking system where banks are competing with each other, and as more banks we got, and as less each bank got of clients, the better it will be for the system. The required reserves that each bank will keep will be very high and will keep it voluntarily. Otherwise, it will be, be under constant threat of going under. And that's the important point that Mises has stressed, that we don't need anything, only free market, free banking, and then the bank will not contribute to printing money. However, when Reserve Bank came into the system, for historical reasons, perhaps, things have changed. Why it's changed? Because the moment Reserve Bank been introduced, it been established as a lender of last resort. The so-called threat to go under nearly disappeared because then banks said, well, if I'm short, short of money, I can borrow it from the central bank. There's no problem. On top of it, the central bank has encouraged excessive lending by various banks, and therefore the various banks could settle the unbacked money, if you want, with each other, and nobody would go under. So therefore, when the Reserve Bank was introduced, the central bank was introduced, banks lost their independence, and they become so-called branches of central bank. They become really a cartel. The whole banking system become one huge bank guided by a central bank all over the world. And therefore, it's not anymore free banking. And banks started to really become a machinery of printing money. And on top of it, when authorities realize that they're basically printing money, they're forging money, if you want, they, they actually behave like a thieves in this respect. So the authorities said, well, let's introduce some laws to minimize their stealing, to minimize the stealing. Instead of, and, and they said, well, let's be a little bit lenient because those guys must make profit so they can keep fractional reserves against every deposit they can keep, not 100%, but 50%, 20%, or whatever. And that's where, the, the, that's really how banks started to create money and how it really looks like. Banks in the world today, and they're not free banks at all, they're not free banks at all, operate on so-called fractional reserves, right? And they, let's suppose, suppose they got certain amount of reserves, they're called reserve assets, if you want, and uh, they have to keep certain amount by law, right, in order not to steal too much. And the, the residual, it's called lending base, lending base. And what really means? What does it mean, lending base? It means if banks got more excess reserves, right, they can lend more. That's really what they want. They want to really lend. They lend assets that doesn't belong to them, basically. And the moment they lend more, they create more deposit. When they create more deposit, they create more money stock. Therefore, money is created as a result of this particular system. Now the question now is, is how various reserves assets are defined in various countries. Let's have a look on two cases, one South Africa and one United States of America. Until very recently, and I think it's still with us, the following uh, reserves classification took place. In the United States of America, the reserves that banks had to keep against deposit, which are liabilities of the bank, were coin and banknotes and balances with central bank, so-called cash-based system. In South Africa, the reserves were very long because we like complexity, right? And we like complexity, so we had reserves, treasure bills, land bank papers, short-term government stock, banker acceptances, IDC bills, coal deposit with discount houses, coal deposit with NFC, coin and banknotes, and balance with reserve bank. Very long list, isn't it? Now, these were the reserves in South Africa. Now, let's have a look. Let's have a look how the American cash-based system operates and how the American, American Federal Reserve Bank can control the money supply if he believes there's too much money in the system. So first of all, imagine the Fed believes that there's too much money in the system. In America, all you're gonna do, you are gonna use so-called open market operation. What does it mean, open market operation? It can sell and buy assets. Now, in, in our case, if he believes there's too much money, he would like to sell assets. Now, what assets can he sell? He can sell potatoes, tomatoes, fridges, anything he can sell. These are assets. However, he will not sell potatoes. Why? Because it will dampen, affect, uh, discriminate against producers of potatoes. So he will sell something which is, which is more acceptable, more, uh, not more refined. Let's say he will sell treasury bills, right? And he will sell treasury bills to the market. The moment it sells treasury bills to the market, market could be anyone. Market buys it, buys it, and exchange these treasure bills for means of exchange, which are money, cash. And Fed will get cash, market will get treasure bills, and what will happen as a result of this process? Very interesting thing will take place. Banks 
will lose cash because I have withdrew a certain amount of cash in order to pay the central bank for the treasury bills which I acquired. And banks will have less cash, less cash, less reserve assets, less reserve assets, less lending, less lending, less deposit, less deposit means, means smaller money stock. Now, interesting thing as far as the, the, the treasury bill proceeds in America, treasury bills in America are assets of the central bank. Therefore, the proceeds are not flowing back into the economy. They are frozen with the central bank. Now, let's have a look how things are operating in South Africa. In South Africa, rem and remember all the time the South African reserve asset system, imagine or assume there is plenty of money in the system, and the reserve bank wants to mop up the money from the system using open market operation as an American, and assume also here that the market is only commercial banks, and commercial banks decided, elected to buy treasury bills because the price was correct. And what will happen? The commercial banks will, will acquire treasury bills, and they will lose cash. However, nothing will happen to the reserve assets of the banks. Why? Because treasury bills and cash are reserve assets in South Africa. So what will happen? Composition will change. Before, this rectangular was the size amount of the reserve assets, right? After, the same rectangular remained, right? However, before there was so much cash, now a little bit less cash. Before there was a little bit of treasury bills, now a little bit more treasury bills, and the same amount of other liquid assets. Therefore, the lending potential remains unaltered. However, the story hasn't finished yet, because the proceeds from treasury bills are deposited somewhere. They deposited with the government deposit at the Reserve Bank. And what does, what does it mean? Government will have now more deposits, more rents. Now, government probably will use these rents, and it will spend the money. The moment government will spend the money, well, it will go. It will go to you, to me, and what I'm going to do with this money? I'll deposit it with the banks, Standard Bank, Santam Bank, also the banks. Therefore, the reserve assets of the banks will increase, which means that banks can now lend much more than before because the reserve assets has risen. Therefore, in South Africa, open market operation under, under, under old system, even present system, not only weren't productive, they were damaging in this respect whenever government spent this money. Now, we can have a complication. First of all, complication in South Africa is that we got so-called discount houses. I don't want to go into the issue of discount houses. The important thing that banks have to keep a certain amount of cash not only all of our reserves, in over reserves there are also a certain amount of cash. And suppose they bought plenty of treasury bills, they lost a hell of an amount of cash, and as a result of this, they can that they got shortage of cash. One way of replenishing this cash is to approach discount houses, and they got with discount houses call deposits, and they call them back, and they're happy. The banks are happy. However, discount houses got a problem, they will have a shortage. So therefore, discount houses will approach the reserve bank and they'll borrow outright from the Reserve Bank, and the system is happy. However, SABC will announce the discount houses of the market is short of 700 million. However, it's academic number. It means nothing. The money is already in the system. All it means, discount houses are indebted to Reserve Bank, 500 million or whatever. If, if the Reserve Bank has absorbed plenty of cash, and even replenishing through coal deposit is not enough, then what really happened, the banks can also approach the Reserve Bank, and since Reserve Bank is the lender of last resort, then the banks could borrow in the past from the Reserve Bank, and of course, the sort of process of rediscounting, they will exchange a paper at a discount, right? In other words, discount, which is the interest rate, at a particular interest rate, and that's what will happen, and nothing else. However, the, the present report says that that's precisely the issue. The issue, the report says, that in the past, we haven't charged market-related interest rate. Therefore, banks could abuse this whole process of creation of money. Therefore, if banks will have to approach us, what are we going to do? We'll be very clever this time. We're going to charge them very high interest rate, market-related interest rate. And this, of course, will be a deterrent for creation of money. How it will work? Very simple, the, the, the report says. First of all, will increase the discount rate to a market-related level. Now, who knows what's market-related level? The Reserve Bank will know. Then, of course, it will have an effect on the interest rate, right? Why not? Because if you have to charge, pay a higher interest rate as a cost of funds, then, of course, you're going to charge also more to protect your margins. And therefore, the interest rate in the economy will increase. This, will, of course, should have an effect on demand for credit. And will have an effect on the lending 
and also will have an effect on creation of deposit immediately and of course on money supply. This is the logic of the report. It says very simple and it's much more simpler than to use so-called cash-based system because cash-based system is too trivial so this is really looks much more elegant this way. And uh, one looks at this and says it's very logical basically. It's ve really very logical. However, we know that first of all there is a serious problem. Can really one know that there is a, a direct link between interest rates and money stock just like that? Because we already have seen in my explanation that interest rate is not really affecting directly money supply. On the contrary, money supply has got an effect on the interest rates, right, through uh, on the rent interest rates, but not on the time preference of consumers. Interest rate is part of human action, part of human behavior. So how on earth through through so-called playing with interest rate, you will affect money supply. Very dubious. It's like try to play with price of bread, pr price of share, whatever price. Because it, remember, interest rate are exchange rate between present goods and future goods. And prices, today's prices, are exchange rate between bread and butter, butter and shoes, whatever, right? So the prices are all the time exchange rate. And interest rate is one of the exchange rate. Therefore, playing with the exchange rate between present goods and future goods is not different as to playing with exchange rate between present and present goods. Therefore, there's a serious problem how, how much one wants to distort the economy to have an influence. Of course, we know from general modeling that anything which will be affected in the economy will have an effect on some other variable. It's known fact. One hasn't to, mustn't be a, a very clever for this to know. I can change anything, there will be an effect. However, we're interested in some precise relationship between interest rate and money stock. And that's precisely what the Commission argues it can, incre it can achieve. And, uh, and of course, the, the, the logic behind the Commission's analysis stems from a very simplistic model, very simplistic model, which is a pillar of the Commission's analysis, namely so-called demand for money model. On the horizontal axis, the Commission would measure money stock. On the vertical axis, interest rates, right? In other words, interest rates is price of money. Therefore, the Commission says the following, and assume this model is correct, that in America, in order to affect the economy, we're moving from M0 to M1. In other words, we're shrinking the amount of money, and there are going to be effect on interest rate to go up from I0 to I1, or from 10% to 15%. In South Africa, we'll do in reverse the same story. We can reduce interest rate or increase interest rate and will have an effect on money supply. And this is the logic of this report. In other words, the commission implies directly that there is a direct causality symmetricity between money to interest rate and from interest rate to money. Very simple. The world is easy. No problems. However, let's assume that this is the, the true model. Suppose the model is correct, right? Can this thing be real even in this model? If one looks on this simple model, First of all, we do know in first year economics that these curves are moving around, you know? That's how we teach the students. Then we say, however, if interest repayment increases, not interest rate, interest repayment, a factor interest repayment, because higher interest rate means requires you need more funds, this curve can shift, right, to the right. Then it will upset completely the whole, the whole movement in the interest rate, and then even in this model, the amount changes in money supply will be totally unpredictable. The other problem is, of course, if Commission of Inquiry wants to use model of this nature, it has to tell us what is the slope or how this curve looks like. Because if you make some policy, you must know something about this. And suppose you know this curve, how it looks like, you must bring some verification. That's how it looks like, and so that's what I'm going to do. So therefore, in the first year economics, we teach the students so-called elasticity of the curve. Right? Elasticity of the curve. Therefore, the Commission must come and tell us how elastic is this curve. Let's assume it's not elastic, even in this model. What will happen? If it's not elastic, then I, can, I have to push the interest rate to a very high level, in other words, to a very high level, and then the effect on the money stock will be very negligible. Now, Commission of Inquiry hasn't produced this evidence, but let's assume it would produce. Do you think I would believe them? I would never believe them. Why? Because curves of this nature do not exist, right? They're a metaphor for thinking. They're all subjected to a simple statement all other things being equal, so-called ceteris paribus, all other things being equal. However, all other things being equal being invented by the economists, by philosophers, in order to tame the world, in order for us to think a little bit clearer. Therefore, therefore, this is a metaphor for thinking, right? 
And therefore, no one will establish such a nice square as such, right? And therefore, it's a myth, it's a fiction, right? So therefore, even if the commission would discover such a thing, I would have a serious issue with them. Second, I got serious problem that interest rates, it hasn't got direct effect on money supply, right? There is no causality in such respect as we pre presented from interest rate to money. Therefore, what effect would happen, would take place if interest rate will be a controlled variable to control money supply in this economy? What will happen is the following. Any interference in prices tends to distort the economy. We call it kill the economy, right? If you push interest rate to certain levels, right, beyond what the market requires, you kill the market. In other words, Increase interest rate will kill the real economy, right? We, we know it, it's happened already, right? And if you kill the real economy, of course, you, you might affect demand for credit also. Why not? Because the economy is getting slower, demand for credit will be also affected, right? And the question now is, how much the demand for credit will be affected? Not clear at all, because we know that higher interest rate requires higher interest rate payment. Second, when companies going under, they want to survive, for survival purposes, they will borrow whatever they, they can, and there won't be so much concern with interest. Therefore, demand for credit not necessarily drops even in a hell of a depression, right? Even, even not in a hell of a depression. So basically, so basically, what this policy can achieve, this policy can achieve the following. It can, first of all, kill the economy, which we can agree. However, it not necessarily will remove the excessive monetary growth, in re again, excessive monetary growth in relation to real goods and services, and therefore, the unbanked monetary growth not necessarily will, be dis will disappear. Therefore, this policy not necessarily will reduce inflation. On the contrary, it can even increase inflation. Why? We got this uh, phenomenon called stagflation. Why do you think we got stagflation in the world? Precisely as a result of the fact that we got dead economies and relatively more amount of money in the system, and that's really what we call stagflation or inflation with recession. And uh, if one looks again on the proposal of the Commission of Inquiry, it says the following. First of all, we would like to control interest rates. Through interest rates, we'll control real economy. Through real economy, we'll control demand for credit and money stock. However, we say it's not, not enough. You're, all, you're gonna affect excessive monetary growth from real economy and from money stock. And therefore, the effect on buying power of money is not clear at all, and also not clear on inflation rate. And, uh, and, consequently, and consequently, it's not clear really what this policy can achieve. Of course, the Commission says, now, if we're going to target monetary growth, we'll succeed. The question, how we can target something which we don't really have the weapon or the variable or the, uh, or the, or the means to get to it first of all, right? So it becomes very dubious. But let's assume one can target it. Let's assume one can target it. We'll come to this again. The important thing is to illustrate how this thing operates in reality. And if one looks, if one looks on South African economy for the last several years, first of all, recently we observed that the real economy, as measured by real index of activity, has collapsed hell of a lot. Right, you can see it how, how well it collapsed. Demand for credit, demand for credit has softened also, right, as a result of a dead economy. Not very significantly, year on year, during May, the demand for credit in the economy as a whole was 36% year on year. Still quite high for such a depression. And uh, monetary growth dropped to a much lower level to around 26%. However, the unbacked monetary growth, as measured on a quarterly basis by the monetary growth minus real activity, didn't drop at all. On the contrary, it still remained very high. And during the first quarter, it was still in excess of 40%, implying that we managed to add to our system, relatively to real economy, 40% of unbacked money. In other words, 40% of fraudulent money, if you want. In other words, this really what causes the steals from the real producers, the real goods and services. So this is really the underlying inflation in South Africa. Now, contributors to this. First of all, the Commission of Inquiry has encouraged the banks to lend more. Why? First of all, it's reduced the required liquid assets from around 80% with supplementary requirement to around 20% at present. In other words, the Commission says 
it's really very bad. I feel sorry for the banks because they were totally restrained. They couldn't make proper profits. We have reduced, we must reduce the required reserves. There mustn't be warehouses anymore. And they must really lend and print more. They must make profit out of it. And so-called credit multiplier has shot up from 90, during 1980, from 1980 to 1985, from a level of around one to around seven. In other words, today, banking system, it's like a factory. You put one rent, it makes seven rent. How it makes seven rent? Very easy, at the stroke of a pen. It, the banker writes it. And that's really, we create money, something out of nothing, very easy, because the system is conducive for this, because we felt sorry for the banks. Now, the commission says, well, it's, it's an issue, it's happened. But when we look again and again on, uh, on uh, this development, we we'll ask ourselves, let's have a look on the development as far as the unbanked monetary growth in South Africa from 67 until 85. What really happened? And if one looks on the unbanked monetary growth in South Africa from 67, from 67 until 1985, one discovers some strange development. Number one, until 1980, South Africa's unbacked monetary growth was on average 5%. And we had very low inflation, really. We had half, on average, 5% unbacked monetary growth. From 1980, all of a sudden, we had an explosion. Now the commission says, we know about it. But why it happened? Because of a word called velocity and reintermediation and disintermediation, a magic word. Now, what does it mean, disintermediation? Disintermediation means that until 1980, the Reserve Bank did not, first of all, kept the banks under strict control straight jacket, 80% required reserves, because the Reserve Bank knew, well, those guys printing money. Well, we have to find way and means to prevent them from printing money. And we know it's not free banking. Our task is to prevent them to print money. Second, the 20% of discretionary lending was also curtailed by so-called credit ceilings. I don't like credit ceilings. It's a way of intervention. However, I prefer better inter intervention than bad intervention. And credit ceilings cost coupled with a higher reserve requirements caused that the quantities, quantity of money created was very limited. However, from 1980, we decided to introduce free market approach in unfree banking, in unfree banking, remember? And of course, the thieves started to print. I don't call, please don't take it as thieves, but that's really what happened. We started to print money and unbanked monetary growth <coughs> exploded, why not? Banks are machine, you give them more, they'll print more, right? So unbanked monetary growth ex exploded. This is very serious because this means that we have created a hell of inflation. However, the commission says that this, this has been caused by disintermediation. In other words, the commission says that before 1980, monetary stock was not recorded correctly. And that's the biggest mistake. We know that all the time, all the time, money is in the system. Either it's under mattresses or either it's in the bank, right? But it's all the time in the system. What does it mean, disintermediation? Disintermediation means that when banks were prevented to lend on behalf of depositor without really having money, what really happened? That, that they could lend because Reserve Bank didn't allow them. Therefore, there was lending lending between depositors, so-called gray market, and banks were brokers. That's precisely the original function the bank had to fulfill, right? And, uh, and after 1980, the reserve bank allowed them now to keep less required liquid reserves, coupled with the fact that credit ceilings were abolished, and of course, banks started to lend officially, right? Officially by creating money out of nothing. And therefore, we started to call it reintermediation, right? So this intermediation means we didn't allow banks to print money. Reintermediation means we allowed banks to print money, if you want it in layman's language. But these words are confusing. And finally, the report says, but even if the money supply went up, you mustn't worry about this. Why? Because there's such a, such a thing called velocity. And this velocity, even if money supply went up, don't bother with this, because velocity has neutralized this. Now, velocity is an, is an interesting myth interesting word which is abused by the commissioner the way it's been used first of all if money supply went up and it creates inflation however you say you have found something which neutralized this so why you why you worry really with money supply what's the problem the problem is of course that if money supply rises it will create inflation and excess of monetary growth therefore let's have a look on this particular equation of exchange which misses and uh, and uh, Murray Rothbard 
a student of Mises has severely criticized. What really happens here? Here, we, in equation number two, we observe m, which is minus torque, v, velocity, and on the right-hand side, we got p times t, prices times volumes times volume of transaction. And uh, right from the beginning, Mises said this thing cannot hold. Why? Because m times v, right? First of all, cannot be equals to p times t because value of transaction, right? Value of money bought is not equals to value of goods that are obtained because it would be equal, there wouldn't be an exchange. Therefore, he said, it's illegal to assume there is an equality, actually, first of all, right from the beginning, first of all. So immediately, this equation disappears if one accepts von Mises. Second, second, the problem starts, it says, well, let's, let's ask ourselves, what does it mean, V? Why V came here? First of all, money is a stock. P times T is a flow. You can't compare stocks and flow. So. Mr. Fisher, who developed this equation, said, well, let's introduce a flow concept called V. Money circulates, and therefore we solve the problem. Then von Mises came and told him, but money never circulates. It's impossible. Money all the time belongs either to me, either to you. It can be in my pocket, and I can move around in the room. However, this movement got nothing to do with circulation, right? That's what Mises answered. Therefore, he said, it's, it's illegal, illegal to use such a thing. On top of it, he said, if we want to talk about circulation, Economic goods never circulate. Why? Because they belong all the time to somebody. If something, would, if something does circulate, it's only air. Why? Because it's marginal utility, marginal value is zero, right? Nobody really wants it because it's plentiful of it. Therefore, therefore, if you observe, as I said, something which circulates, you're entitled to take it. Why? Because let's assume money would circulate from me to Paul, right? And somebody would stand in between. He could take it, right? Easily, because it doesn't belong to anybody, right? Therefore, this whole concept breaks immediately. However, let's assume it's correct, according to Mises, and let's extract it because, me, because Fisher and Commission really want to extend prices in the economy. So we're coming that P will be equal to M times V divided by T. First of all, the Fisher equation will tell us that prices are determined by the formula. But I have already told you that prices, according to Fisher, Mises, are not determined by formulas. They're determined by human beings, right? They're determined in the markets. Therefore, formulas or things don't create prices. Money is thing, V is perhaps thing, and T is also things. Things don't make prices. Prices are made by human beings, right? By their subjective valuation. Therefore, this whole formula will break again. Let's assume it's still correct. Mises will tell you it will still break. Why? Because what does it mean, T? T, it's a summation of all sorts of real goods and services. All sorts of real goods and services. Now, how can you add up apple, potatoes, shirts, steel, whatever, bananas. You can't add it up. Right? Arithmetically, it's impossible addition. Therefore, this T is, not, is meaningless. There's no such a thing as T. You can't add it up. Therefore, the whole P does not exist. Price level, according, according to Mises and Rothbard, is, does not exist. However, let's assume it's correct. Let's assume it's correct. And somebody still wants to fight with us. Then, then the commission still wants to fight. Then, then let's ask ourselves, what is V? V again will be derived from this equation as P times T divided by M. And then the commission says, you see this V? Yes, I say I'm seeing, I see this V. Then the commission says, if M goes up and V goes down, P will, go, will be neutral, won't go up, right? Then I look at him and I said, but tell me, how come you can say that V will go down or go up, will be neutral, whatever? V hasn't got life on its own. Then somebody looks at this and said, maybe, maybe you're correct. Because V is a definition. We have defined it as PT divided by M. It's not really a something reality. It's a fiction, right, in this respect. It's been defined as PT divided by M. In other words, V is all the time PT divided by M. It hasn't got life on its own. Imagine I'll create a Mr. X. Mr. X is equal to Paul plus Frank. I have defined such a Mr. X. And then I'll say Mr. X has left the room. Is it true? Of course false, because Mr. X cannot leave the room because Paul and Frank still in this room. Therefore, Mr. X is all the time Paul plus Frank. Paul plus Frank. It's not an independent creature. It hasn't got life on its own. Therefore, V is all the time PT over M under this situation. Therefore, let's put it back and ask him, who are you, basically? And MVPT in this equation, we'll find that actually According to 4, put V into V back who this guy is, PT over M, and you'll find that 4 equals P equals to P. In other words, 10 rand, always equals to 10 rand, isn't it, right? 
if I'll, if, I'll, if, if I'll show it in the end, you can tell it's equals to itself, right? Because it's tautology. So basically, the equation is a tautology, means nothing, circular argument. Now, what really the commission wanted to say, basically, is that, and it confused between, between definitions and functions or relationship. For example, there is such a thing called demand for money. When we talk about velocity in our sense, we talk about how fast money changes hands. In this respect, we can say the following. Money will change hand as a result of behavioral pattern. For example, if there'll be too much of money, and I'll know money, value of money will drop, most likely I would like to hold less of it, I'd like to spend more of it. On the other hand, if if there'll be less of money, then I'll try to, I'll like to hold more, right? And therefore money will change less slower hands, if you want, in this respect. Therefore, one has to distinguish between functions and definitions, which unfortunately the Commission probably hasn't understood correctly. And therefore, one asks himself how we can salvage this particular definition that the Commission used, because the Commission said velocity has dropped from nearly more than nine to around four and a half, and therefore it saved South Africa from inflation because if not this would have inflation of million percent. Therefore we should be very pleased, pleased for it. When one looks at this, one asks himself what, true, what kind of truth we're talking about. And one looks at this again and again, we discover that what this particular V is. This V particular is PT, right? PT, right, divided by M all the time. Or we can say that we can also talk about M divided by PT. In other words, when V goes down, According to commissions, very good. What does it mean? It means that we got more money than nominal GDP. That's really the, 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 the ratio. Now, the question that a logical person asks, is it good when we got more money than nominal GDP? Probably not very good because it could mean that we might have a little bit more inflation, even if we measure according to nominal GDP, which is, of course, we know is distorted in many respects. Therefore, I decided to measure the percentage change in money over GDP against changes in CPI in South Africa. And what I have discovered, whenever money over GDP goes up percentage-wise, right, which means velocity percentage-wise goes down, CPI percentage change going up. In other words, whenever velocity goes down, price is going up in South Africa. And whenever velocity goes up, prices are going down contrary to what really the Commission really wanted to tell us. In other words, all we can say, whenever you see V in, in the way the Commission defines goes down, take, make sure this is really what means we're going to have more inflation and not otherwise. Therefore, if one looks on all this, one, one uh, wants to summarize really what really this report uh, worth. Uh, first of all, there's one ach ach advantage achievement in this report namely that it acknowledges the superiority of a free market. However, however, it uh, it's uses all the time intervention type of tools. And let's assume that somebody would ask me what method you would pr offer. And I would use, first of all, von Mises. Von Mises would offer the following method. First of all, he would advocate gold standard, immediately gold standard. Why? Because we got 700 tons a year gold produced, and we should have a commodity money, but commodity money which, first of all, you remove the monopoly from the government to print money. So first of all, mon co commodity money was always good money. We can create very good money. Number two, Mises would say, as a minority view, right, I, I assume that Commission of Inquiry should produce a second report, minority view. As a minority view, Mises would say, if he would be the commissioner also there, that I object well, I recommend to remove Reserve Bank. He would say it immediately, right? To have free banking. And as a compromise, I would accept to have 100% required reserves, right? Under, under these conditions, right? Well, uh, that's really what one can recommend. However, some people say, but you, you were monetarist and uh, you encouraged them. Why don't you adopt American cash-based system? American cash-based system is also a form of intervention. Here we intervene through quantities. It's the same principle as Bob de Jong, Dr. de Jong, the previous governor used to use. It's a little bit better because we operate on the quantities. However, it creates distortions. So-called Friedmanite making a big mistake because they believe that if we'll stabilize the monetary growth, we'll solve our problem. But it's fallacy because they also believe in so-called mythical term price levels. In other words, if monetary growth will be stabilized according to monetarists and rational expectations, it means that people will start to expect this, they'll understand what happened, and therefore they'll expect, they'll know the future price level, therefore they'll adjust.
the operation according to future price levels, and therefore everything will be fine and beautiful. However, Mises immediately would say this is a terrible fallacy because money does not affect everybody immediately in the same way. On the contrary, first of all, when money get injected, it's been received by some certain people who, first of all, they benefit from this money. Right? Number two, when money moves in the economy from person to person, right? From person to person, it has so-called relative price effect, in other words. And in order for individual to anticipate correctly the effect from money supply, you should be in a position to anticipate all the relative prices in the economy. In other words, millions of billions of ratios between prices, which is mission impossible, of course. Therefore, even if you observe for a thousand years the same amount of money, it won't help you because the real effect will be there. What it will mean that you observe and you know somebody steals from you. If you, if you have unexpected money, you still been, will be robbed unexpectedly, in other words. You, in this respect, you'll be, according to Mises, robbed expectedly, right? And nothing you can do. And in other way, unexpectedly. So Friedman argues that expectedly is much better to be robbed than unexpectedly. Well, I'm not so sure about it, you know? So, so and this is really a, a, an issue, in other words, to what, expect, to what extent, to what extent, basically, uh, Friedman approach freedom approach to control money supply could be valid for South Africa, right? Could be valid for South Africa. And of course, and of, and, 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 and of course, if we say that unexpected money or expected money is the same story, it still ends up in a, in a, in a robbery, of course, then one Friedman uh, could be classified by Mises and by other people as an inflationist. In other words, he says, I would like to manage cancer over time. Mises would say, I don't want to manage cancer. I would like to remove it completely. And that's really the difference between uh, Mises would be and Friedman. And of course, if one argues what form of intervention would prefer, I would say if, we, if I haven't got choice and I have to adopt intervention, I would like something which at least I can, I can hit the, the, the thief directly, not indirectly at least, right? So at least if you ask me, Dr. De Jong method or Friedman method are, are better, well, the same story for me, right, in this respect doesn't matter which one, the both intervention. At least the uh, evidence shows that through credit ceilings, we have produced not bad results. So in sum to summarize, uh, I'm a little bit disappointed that uh, the commission introduced all sorts of metaphors, all sorts of uh, claims that it can control money supply. However, as various experts in South Africa and Professor Devet mentioned many times, you cannot control money supply through interest rate. He mentioned many times, four years ago he said, through high interest rate, you kill the economy, and only then you kill the money supply. But that's precisely what we don't want. We don't want to have a medicine which kills good guys and bad guys, not at all. We want to have a medicine which eliminates the bad guys, but leaves the good guys alive. Here, what we're doing, we kill everybody, and then we say it's a success. We want to have policies which are only damaging the thief, right? And that's precisely what we haven't achieved. On the free market approach, as Mrs. would advocate, the market would take care that only good guys would operate. The bad guys would disappear. And that's why these bad guys don't like free market approach. They like interference. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Professor Lachman had to leave and made his apology at an appointment, so he's not with us. And I think the time we had got to the issues that he would have been most interested in, he'd already had to go. Anyway, uh, we've, uh, it is late for some, and if you go, we'll accept that you have to get to something. But are there questions? Uh, Professor DeVette. All contributions? Speak up. Professor Devet, could you come here perhaps? It's better if you come oh, here. You no, no, if you come here, it will be easier. Well, the distance is the same. I mean, the no, you got here a speaker, he loves speakers. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. I would like to elaborate on some things and maybe have Frank's comments. I must say, I, I personally uh, would not think that von Mises or von Hayek would agree to have a gold standard. I would have thought that they would have gone further and said, well, leave it to the market to devise their own means of exchange. And I would 
say why, and that is because, especially now, today, if you accept gold again as the means of exchange under a 100% reserve requirement, of course, then you have the, to my mind, uh, absolute unbearable situation where you would have a monopoly producing the means of exchange. And I, I don't think a free marketeer would really opt for that. But, you know, I mean, that's my view. I would say that, uh, that for Mises and for Hayek, that means the, the Austrian school in general would say, well, bring it back to the free market. And I would also endorse that, that you leave it to the market to create its own means of exchange. And in the same way, you will, you will find that in the end, the market will stabilize and find those means of exchanges which are all acceptable in the market. But I would like to make one comment, and I know certainly that the Koch Commission certainly does not see it this way, that the people in the Commission certainly think, maybe until last Monday, because I have an idea that they conceded last Monday at another conference that actually they won't be able really to control the, the, the uh, supply of money, they actually conceded that the supply of money is endogenous under the system which they have. Could I make this comment for those who are really interested in economics, that of course under the system which we have in South Africa, and as a matter of fact, this is mainly the system all over the world, where the banks have access through the discount window to, the, to any central bank. That means when the central bank fulfills its function as a lender of last resort, when one gets to the uh, normal Keynesian type of thing which we all learn in Economics 1 and Economics 2, that the money supply is a vertical curve, of course that's not true. If you have a system where the Reserve Bank operates as lender of last resort. That means whether you have a cash-based cash system or not, money supply becomes a horizontal curve. Money supply, the supply of money, becomes perfectly elastic because it means that banks, whenever they are in short of cash, even under a cash-based system, if there's a discount window, and all central banks all over the world act as lenders of last resort. Then the banks can go to the central bank and get cash in order to comply with the cash reserve requirements. So instead of having a vertical money supply curve, you have a horizontal money supply curve. And then of course if you fit onto that the somewhat curved demand curve for money, then of course you would find the situation that the Reserve Bank now, and especially in South Africa, can of course set the rate of interest at which it would lend to the banks. And by shifting up and down the horizontal supply curve of money, you would find the equilibrium point where the horizontal supply curve of money cuts the demand curve exactly as Frank showed there, but I think we should put it out specifically, you have a horizontal supply curve. And through that means, of course, you would have the equilibrium amount of money, which is called the supply of money. And I know the Commission has certainly not seen it that way. But in that way, of course, then by shifting up and down, the level at which this horizontal supply curve is actually uh, line, then of course they could in the end determine the equilibrium amount of money. But of course, as Frank pointed out, they don't know what's going to happen to the demand curve. As the demand curve shifts in and out, you would still find that the supply of money, the equilibrium amount, would still change. And especially under inflation, you would have the demand curve shifting out all the time, and all you would find is you would find inflation, that is rising prices, 
and you would find the banks all the time experiencing a greater demand for money because in the real economy there would be an increase in the demand for money because of inflation, higher wages and so on. They would run, the people would run to their banks and the banks would say, well, yes, we lend you the money because we have access to the reserve bank through the discount houses, of course, the, the technical uh, way in which they do it is not important. They have access to the reserve bank and what happens is interest rates go up all the time and prices go up all the time. As prices go up, people go to the banks, they lend more money, the m banks go to the central bank and they get more money there and interest rates go up but everybody is happy because they can afford it and that's exactly what we had here in South Africa over the past couple of years. That's my analysis. But now I have one thing which might save us in the end. Let me say that I would in principle support the Austrian type of approach because I also would not like interference whether you do it through the interest rate or whether you do it through uh, trying to determine on a cash based system with of course then a closed discount window. You cannot op control money supply through cash reserves if at the same time you have a discount window. But if you close the discount window, and that of course would be uh, Friedman's uh, solution, close the discount window and have a 100% cash base, but of course that becomes a bit of a problem then because then of course you don't have flexibility again in the system, which is very necessary in the complex system which we have. Therefore you should abandon both types of, of, of interference with the market and let the market determine what should be the means of exchange. That I would think would have been the ultimate solution. But, given the present situation, I think we have to be realistic. Uh, anybody at this stage who would advocate this type of approach too loudly would by the South African press and by the politicians and everybody be called a lunatic. I think we all know that. I think it still needs some time in South Africa for people to educate the other people into this thinking and maybe in 10 or 20 years time we will have a position where the politicians in the end the general public and the press would be able to accept this approach in the meantime we we actually settled now with a situation where there will be interference and will the interference now be through a situation where the reserve bank with a hundred percent reserve ratio and a closed discount window now, where the Reserve Bank then has to decide by what amount they will let the money increase from year to year. That's just as difficult a decision as it is to determine what the interest rate should be. But if they are serious when they say that they would let themselves be led by market forces, and of course over the short term, how would they know what the market forces are? But over the long run, I believe they will have an indication what the market forces will be and then of course over the long run you will find that the discount rate will more or less shift up and down as the need for interest rates to shift up and up and down arises but what will happen now is of course we have a system now where you have a discount window and you also have leakages on the reserve uh, side so what will happen now if, uh, is if money flows into the country and the banks acquire more reserves, not from the government or from the reserve bank, but through the balance of payments, then of course the need to go to the reserve bank and borrow from the reserve bank will of course diminish. And if now the reserve banks say, no, we're going to keep the rate at 20%, we like it here, then of course they will lose their control over the banks because then in the end the market shortage will vanish. Because we must realize the Reserve Bank wants the market shortage to be maintained. Because the moment there's no market shortage, the banks will not be in the Reserve Bank and the Reserve Bank will have no control whatsoever over them. So the Reserve Bank will, as cash flows into the country from outside, the Reserve Bank, whether they like it or not, will be compelled to let the discount rate drop. Otherwise, 
banks will not borrow from the central bank anymore because they will have enough reserves from other sources. But of course, the, in the end, the uh, final story of it is that the money supply is still endogenous. Bank, the central bank doesn't have control over the money supply. I would like to have Frank's comments on that. First of all, as far as the, as far as the gold standard is concerned, I believe that uh, this, uh, is, if one looks through history, <coughs> over the last 10,000 years, gold was accepted as accepted medium of exchange right, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the population, right, by peoples on the earth. So this was naturally selected by the individuals. Number two, uh, because of the issue that you mentioned, that there could be a hell of a liquidity from balance of payment, now uh, how? Anything else and gold could solve the problem. And I'll, and I'll provide an explanation. Let's, let's imagine we got gold standard, and simultaneously we also got gold backed rands, floating rands around with gold. And uh, every rand is covered by gold. Nothing wrong. We can use either, either gold rand as a medium of exchange or Kruger rand. And let's assume that price of bread is one Kruger rand or one paper gold rand. And, uh, and that's really what the price, the market decided. All of a sudden, Reserve Bank decided to cheat the market and print more paper rents, paper gold, or through balance of payment, more paper rents, paper gold rents are created. What will happen is individuals are not stupid. First of all, value of paper rent will drop, and price of bread in terms of paper gold rent will be one rent fifty. Well, in the past it was one rent. So the individuals say, look, I don't like to pay one rent fifty, I like to pay one rent. So basically, and it will come with the paper rent to the Reserve Bank, and this paper rent will be written, I promise you in Pretoria to convert one paper gold rent into ones of gold, equivalent ones of gold. Then it comes to Reserve Bank, please, you can have your paper rent, give me gold back. The moment this happens, there will be natural conversion, natural control by the market as far as the amount of paper rent is concerned. And therefore, the, 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 it will be very natural. Market will be the guardian, basically, the guardian as to what will happen to the amount of money. Second, uh, Mrs. Of von Hayek would also argue, particularly Mrs. would argue, doesn't matter what amount of money we can have in the system. They argue that it's uh, irrelevant, irrelevant whether one has to have more money or less money, because money, contrary, to other goods and services, if you got more of it, doesn't give you more benefit. If you get got more of bread, or more of sun, or more of disco, or more of shows, it gives you more benefit. More money in the system doesn't give you more benefit, it gives you, creates more damage. Therefore, as far as they are concerned, you can have any amount of money, it will be optimal. And this particular amount of money will be adjusted, right? to give an amount of real goods and services, and, it, and the value, of course, will fluctuate. They don't subscribe to have fixed value of money, not at all. They would like the value of money will be determined as value of any good good in the system, any good. In other words, contrary to Friedman, we would like to have fixed value for money, so-called interference in the value of money, which is bad. They said, let the value of money be established by the market. However, leave it to the market. They wouldn't like that somebody will print and add money to the system, which interferes with the market. So any amount of money is fine. And they subscribe, or not, not von Hayek, but Mises and Rothbard, they subscribe to gold because, first of all, first of all, if one goes to von Hayek principle, so-called bank's money, and von Hayek has offered that each bank will issue its own money, uh, followers of Mises got a serious problem. First of all, no one can create just like that money, and people will accept, because money is accepted as a result of one important thing because it had historical value. This was the famous circular Austrian solution that von Mises has provided. Nobody in, the, in academia could resolve the issue why people hold money. Because after all, why do you hold a piece of paper? Why would you like to hold it? And on top of it, you said that it's got a value. We know in the, from, from economics that values are determined by the money and supply, right? In other words, value of particular good will determine by the money and supply. However, However, in this respect, what really happened is that value of money was, is there because you hold it, right? And value of other commodities determined by subjective valuation. Here you got a piece of paper. What kind of value it got? Piece of paper. You don't want to eat it, whatever. You can't consume it. And yet, and yet you said there is a value. However, value is determined by demand. 
therefore it's become so-called circular Austrian problems, circular problem, nobody could resolve it. And then Mr. Samuelson came and said, I solved this problem. How? How? Very simple. The reason why people accept money, because it's a paradox. What does it mean paradox? You accept because I accept, and I accept because you accept, and you accept because I accept, therefore we all accept. And that surely was a solution, but then people said, Austrian said it's not a good solution. Then, then uh, Spetenkin and some other guy came and said, no, there is better solution. There's so-called simultaneity. Things are determined simultaneously. Don't ask why simultaneously and, and people want to hold money. Then, of course, Mises said it's impossible because money is part of human behavior, human action. Therefore, we must go back and find out how money was evolved over time. And money was evolved because initially it was a commodity, as normal commodity. It had used value. And over time, it, it started to have also exchange value. And over a thousand years, the use, the use value diminished while exchange value increased. And in a period number one, the moment the use value dropped, right, there was a value to this commodity because people got history in their head. They remember that this particular commodity had value. And therefore, in period number one, when it became means of exchange, but not use value, use for use, people still hold it because they remembered, remembered that in the past it, they appreciated for different reasons. And that's really how it evolved. In other words, from gold, various paper money developed, developed because there was linkage, right? It's from historical reasons. Therefore, Mises argues that, that it's impossible for no one, neither for government, neither for banks, no one on earth to come and say, here is money, take it because people won't take it. People are not idiots. They have to look and go around and accept it through development over time. And therefore, money, South Africa's money today, is also backed from, uh, from some certain history, which probably originated from when we had gold. And therefore, high proposition is rejected by Misesian, right? And in particular, by, by a person like, uh, like Rothbard and all the other guys. Therefore, Mises would still advocate the gold standard. However, as far as monopoly is concerned, well, you know, it's, it's an interesting issue, right? Monopoly. Why does monopolies really would go and, uh, and, uh, and have a particular monopoly in this? In other words, uh, can physically South Africans expend more than 700 tons a year? Very difficult. There's, there's physical limitation. Number two, number two, if it will be produced more than 700 tons, then remember, gold can also have a used value. We can use it as a jewelry, whatever, right? So it won't be really a waste or something which is going to damage things. So maybe we'll find some imperfection in the gold standard as such. But remember, as Mises says, human beings are not perfect, and they're not meant to be perfect. Because if they'll be perfect, they'll be superhumans. If they'll be superhumans, they will know the future. If they'll know the future, they won't, won't act. And if they won't act, they'll be dead. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, superhumanity means you will belong to the world of eternity, somewhere else, not the world of humans. That would be his argument. Therefore, we, we don't mind to have imperfections, but there should be a degree of imperfections. And markets got imperfections. Markets are not perfect, but they settle with each other. An example, rugby players. People playing rugby, they kill each other, they murder each other, and there is in between the referees refereeing them, right? As long as he referees as a neutral guy, they can murder and play and then they enjoy themselves. <laughs> However, when a referee tackles them, what happens? They get confused. They get confused, they can't play anymore. And that's the really problem. We really don't want the referee to interfere. Let them be referee, don't tackle us, and we'll be as imperfect as we won't be, but we'll be natural. And everything will come to and everything will come to normality. Yeah, I think it is uh, probably time to close the in half an hour. So, I mean, at, at 7.30. So let's be quick, please, with the questions. I'll start at the back, then introduce this thing. Just a very short question. I'm not carrying your uh, futuristic model of a gold standard where you allow me to have my own money supply with anybody else who wants to have that. I want to have a silver backed uh, money system or whatever. Can I issue my own notes in your system? Uh, or are you saying that government can do not monopoly on that? Well, my presumption would be that if you allowed me, or even if I more expertise in the money supply than I, to produce money, that you would very possibly find that, that, that they would produce a better money. And they might actually do the government out of business. 
Well, let's let's a little bit be realistic. We, uh, we won't remove the Reserve Bank because people have been employed and they get getting salary. No, it won't be so vicious. So let's assume there will be a Reserve Bank. The uh, function of the Reserve Bank will be to issue this gold back, gold paper money, right? And this will be in line with the amount of gold mined in South Africa. And so, so that's what South Africa's gold production will be the means of exchange. And this will be channeled through Reserve Bank, if you want, right? That's it, you know, once and for all. And that's it, basically. And, uh, and uh, if you don't want the Reserve Bank, let's put somebody else, right? It's irrelevant. Reserve Bank, would you, would you system allow anyone else Look, you see, uh, uh, Professor Devet raised an important issue that that uh, people, you know, might be thieves or whatever. You know, possibility, right? So, you know, we got we don't want to remove government completely from the economy. I'm not an anarchist. I believe there's a function for a government. Therefore, government function is to keep protect the law and order, police, etc. So I wouldn't mind it to to be sort of a, like a custodian, a middleman to to channel the gold supply and issue its 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 paper its liabilities backed up by gold right that's that's the system which i would envisage right in in this framework i think what's uh, apparent perhaps to people who haven't uh, i know some who haven't been involved in the uh, so we say the free market inner circle debates uh, i think what's become apparent is the wide, wide divergences that exist between even schools we haven't got represented here. Our president is Jan Lombard, a member of the commission. Carol de Kock is one of our patrons. And uh, so within our family, we have debates that uh, I think even uh, Chris Tor over there would argue that there are similarities between uh, the Keynesians and the Austrians that bring Keynesians even closer to us than perhaps the monetarists and maybe the criticisms of the monetarists from Kirtan from uh, Frank over here would uh, find some kind of sympathy with Chris on the show. Let's have useless. Friedrich um, Hayek in his denationalization money stated that uh, there should be sorry, competition in currency, competition between banks, and that in this way, in a free market in currency, the best money would win out in the end. But it appears to me what Frank is saying is we have a reserve bank and we have to live with it. And the best way to control the reserve bank uh, is to have a commodity money like gold. Now, if that is correct, then he's also <coughs> in agreement with Hayek. This is what Hayek says. <coughs> if you can't have competition in currency, uh, then uh, Gold would be, in his in his view, would be second best. It would be uh, a discipline uh, for governments and for uh, and and for banks. But as we know, gold also has its problems. <coughs> we have the problem historically of uh, Spain, where the Spanish went over to South America and plundered and brought back the gold and minted coins and started buying, the king started buying with them and he wondered why the prices went through the, through the sky. So it can happen with gold, but because of the physical problems uh, related to the production of gold, there is a limitation on the amount of gold that can be produced and this of course limits the amount of money. But uh, I, would, I would go along with Frank completely and under conditions where you have a reserve bank, then certainly the best kind of discipline could be imposed on them is to have uh, a commodity uh, money like gold and particularly uh, in South Africa it makes a lot of sense because then the uh, the exchange control regulations which do such a lot of damage <coughs> to this country to the people in this country could be abolished because who would could possibly have an objection to people taking gold out of South Africa because uh, so much of it is produced here, um, and if people had to, if they had gold as, as, as money and went away with it, they would be doing just what is happening now, because all the gold that's produced gets shipped out anyway. <laughs> no, well, see, I'm, I'm not in In fact, I believe that, imagine, everybody could imagine if you were being paid in How would you feel? You know, every month you get 
a certain amount of crude grains. You feel very nice, you know, you know it's something beautiful, you know. So instead of getting paper currency. Of course, uh, from the Hayek principle of having a uh, competition between banks' money, it's got a serious problem. That's what the Rothbard and Misesian showed because it hasn't got the historical link because it came out of the blue, really. And, and that's really the problem, why people should accept money from Standard Bank or from Trust Bank or whatever. You know, it could happen, but why should it be, in other words? That's the, 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 un, the unresolved I I issue which Misesian uh, arguing that it's impossible. They said everything must have a traditional link, in other words. And, and, and here, there won't be a traditional link at all, in other words, because all of a sudden, some institutions started to issue money. Let's say I'll, I'll issue money. Why should somebody accept it as a means of exchange? It can only be evolved over many years, right? That unless I'll prove myself in everything, right? In some respect. Otherwise, it'll be very difficult. So therefore, therefore, uh, it's, a, it's a problematic issue. So gold, if I accept the second best, right? You know, we all agree, so it's, it, couldn't, it couldn't be a problem. In fact, I also would encourage that any company who makes profit in South Africa, she, it, it'll, be, it'll get Kruger Rand as a bonus. Any company who makes losses, right? A bit tax penalized. In other words, and in other words, tax for those who make losses, Krugerans for those who make profit. Really, and that's maybe <laughs> make things better. Right? Leon, I've got a slightly different perspective. I've got a newspaper report here which says that the the Commission's report was based on the assumption that South Africa has a very sophisticated financial system. It appears to me, being involved in small business, we have two economies in South Africa. We've got a sophisticated economy. We've got an unsophisticated economy. The majority of the actors in our whole economic system, in fact, belong to the unsophisticated side of the, of the situation. And quite frankly, no solution is going to work until we have financial institutions which are accessible to those unsophisticated people. And that's what worries me about this thing, because our banking system isn't accessible to them. In fact, our whole system is geared to stopping these people from producing goods and services that they can exchange. And so I have a very real problem with the whole situation. I sort of feel rather we're sort of like fiddling here while Rome's burning. We're creating a very sophisticated system. What we should be doing is creating unsophisticated financial institutions which are in fact accessible to the majority of the people in this country. And then this whole system is going to actually start working. Uh, it's very interesting what you said. When you said unsophisticated, or sophisticated, it's really, to my mind, it's, it's, it doesn't mean much to me. No, because I really would like to have simple system. Simple system that it's accepted means of exchange, it's means of exchange. And, and it doesn't matter whether a person is a primitive or not primitive, he knows what money is because he has to eat. And he knows if he won't bring some particular piece of paper or particular metal, he will know he won't get for this the goods he wants, right? So therefore, we observe in any society, it doesn't matter how primitive, they know what means of exchange means. So therefore, if you tell gold, Gold, every primitive guy knows what gold is, huh? because it's for 10,000 years. If you tell them paper money, primitive guys won't accept it. We know it, because they're very suspected. They, they, they're, actually, they're actually revealing their natural instinct. They're not so much corrupt in their thinking. They're more natural. And therefore, primitive guys will not accept paper money. However, they'll accept the gold, metal, something which is durable. You can touch it. Well, that's very good. Right? You know, in history, that's what Friedman describes, Mises describes. The means of exchange were cattle, right? Grand wives, you know, wives were means of exchange. All sorts of things, right? Why? That's really how people really felt. They felt really with this. And therefore, the more durable these things, the more concrete it, the better it. It will be very, very acceptable for everybody. Paper, it's really a myth. You know, what's a piece of paper? Uh, the, uh, any, any other burning questions, failing which I'm going to ask one myself? Mr. Chairman, yes. Uh, I enjoyed Frank's analysis. We did it in the Buddha Manir in Free State. <laughs> We're saying that basically inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. Uh, where that money comes from is obvious. Now, the final demand sector is not interest rate elastic. The production sector is, so the higher you make the interest rates, the more you kill the too few goods that you're going to supply, and this is what's happening. And I'm sitting slam bang in the production sector, and we're feeling that pinch. What scares the hell out of us is where the government is going to go to. We know that the solution hasn't worked over the past four years, it's escalated in the wrong direction. They want to continue working that, they want to entrench that system. Um, it's interesting to debate on whether we should have a free system or a gold-backed system. 
obviously a gold standard can't work because it's a artificial thing. You've got to couple your money to gold at a certain rate. The moment you use, you, you, you move internationally, uh, and every country selects uh, its own exchange rate to gold now, how, how does that exchange rate fluctuate? It's going to be an artificial thing, and I don't think the system is there to sort it out. But I don't think that is the important point. For us, the important point is what's the next step? We've got Reserve Bank, we're not going to wish it away. They've just built a brand new building. <laughs> they want to move into that. Uh, they themselves aren't interest rate elastic, they borrowed 3%. So they don't understand the concept. What are we going to do next? The vibrations one gets out of the current economic setup is that production is going back. Except the subsidized production. Uh, Okay, that cannot continue, but we need to get production going. And that's interest rates must come down. I'm much rather in favor of bank ceiling, some direct measure of controlling the credit available to the final demand sector until we can do a sort of a balance. So my one question is, what is the next step? My second question is perhaps your views on something that scares me as well under the current setup. Relaxing the exchange control regulations at this stage means more money flows out the country, which means the interest rates even still higher, which means a negative effect on production, which means the system, the wheel turns in the wrong direction than what I would want it to turn. Please, your comments, please. Okay. First of all, uh, I, I really, I will brief, comment briefly on the, that you disagree on the gold standard. I don't think it's unrealistic. It's very realistic. Could be higher. We got accustomed to present system, and we, we don't want to think in another system. It's, it's subconsciously. So we call something unrealistic because we don't know it, right? It's easy to say. It's irrelevant whether the rest of the world won't have gold standard. This is, will be Krugerrands, will be means of exchange in South Africa, full stop, right? We, we don't care really what the rest of the world does. Second, on the, con on the contrary, everybody will come to South Africa to get the Krugerrands. We'll have plenty of dollars. Number two, as far as the present policy, we got Reserve Bank, they build new building, and they all want to enjoy the new building. What will happen? First of all, <laughs> first of all, I believe, and as Professor Devet mentioned, we have more or less top-go policy. If we have balance of payment surplus, plenty of liquidity, banks will say, and I'm not interested in what the Reserve Bank does with interest rate. I'll do my my job, right? Because Reserve Bank will not be in a position to create shortage while there is no shortages, right? So Reserve Bank will have very ineffective tools. That's the biggest tragedy, right? Number two, suppose somehow they will manage shortages. The, the, the policy will be all the time to keep the economy in the fridge in order to keep money under control. But we don't want to, to be in the fridge all the time. It's very cold, you know, so we want to see a little bit sun. So it won't work properly. So we'll have a very chilly economy. And from time to time, somebody will say, look, it's too, fr it's too cold. Let's, let's, let's allow people to see the sun. And we'll reduce interest rates, you know, to a very nice level. And everything will go boom, and everybody will be happy. Precisely Misesian business cycle. Mises has explained that business cycles are creation of printing money or credit, right, through interest rates. In other words, when you reduce interest rate, you don't know what's the natural level of interest rate, so you interfere in the time preferences of individual and their consumption pattern. You create an illusion. When you print money, you create artificial forms of life. For example, for example, you print money. Somebody got the money. It feels strong. It goes and buy goods and services, and and the guy who produces goods and services takes his resources from the genuine people who, who really would like to have this, it takes it from them to, to support the artificial guy. And then everybody's happy, the people operate for this artificial guy, and he wears a nice tie and a suit, and he becomes very strong. And one day, the guy on the reserve bank says, look, there's high inflation. Well, let's stop this, this supply of money, and it stops a bit. And this artificial forms of life screams. He said, I made a life here, I am very important, you can't really stop me just like that. And then that's what we call lobby. And of course, the government got a serious problem because the guy, the monster, the artificial monster, becomes very strong. And he can't really fight him. And I said, OK, 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 I'll reduce the interest rate down back. And we'll start again, new boom, bust, little bit bust, new boom, new bust. In other words, a recession, as Mises said, when it's naturally, is the first signs of creating a re recovery. A very well-known financial paper slammed me for being a follower.